So what are some ways that you have progressed or your thinking has changed as far as reptile keeping is concerned? Well, the biggest thing of all is that reptiles are far more intelligent than even I thought they were. Yeah. They're serious power from day one if you treat them huma in a humane way to begin with. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean keeping ball pythons and little pat, you know, pull out boxes and giant retics and vision cages and all this other nonsense. It's really cruel and inhumane. All the puppy mill producing that's going on now, it's the same as puppy mills, except we're using reptiles instead of puppies, but it's the same thing. And, you know, um, that is a sentiment that I've shared before as well, and it's one that does not get, people really don't like that opinion at all. Although, welcome back to the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. This is the podcast that inspires others to push the limits of their reptile husbandry by promoting high-level creative care individualized for each reptile. All right, this is episode number 75, and we have a very special episode, as you can probably tell by the guest name on the title. Before we jump into today's episode, as always, if you want more information on the show, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find links to each of the shows on the network, as well as all the show notes for each episode that has been published. Thank you to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the show notes as well as the YouTube description box. Again, if you do click that and purchase something, a small commission does come back to me at no extra cost to you and you are supporting the podcast. You know, you always hear that cliche, my guest needs no introduction, but today that is virtually true for my guest. Today I'm speaking with Tom Crutchfield who... I think, as I say in the early parts of this podcast, is probably one of the most recognizable names in American herpetoculture and really across the world. Tom has been part of the reptile hobby in many different capacities over the last five decades. And as one of my guests put it a few weeks ago or a few months ago, what Tom hasn't done in the reptile hobby probably isn't worth doing. And I think there's probably no truer statement. Tom for sure has hours and hours worth of podcast material in his brain and probably a book. So I'd love to revisit a conversation with him at some point. But I was super grateful that we could get this 35 minutes with him today. Now, before we jump into it, I just want to say Tom lives in a very remote area in Florida, and because of that, it has very, very poor internet connection. And we were actually quite surprised at how much of the conversation we were able to do on Zoom before we kind of lost connection. So that's part of the reason why the episode is truncated. We kind of started to lose connection, and it just became a little bit too challenging to talk, you know, to have a dialogue moving back and forth. Now, I've kind of patched it together a little bit because at some points I was losing him and I kind of patched it together. The middle part of the podcast is pretty good. His voice is quite clear. At the beginning, you're going to hear him come in and out just a little bit. You're going to get a little bit of that robotic voice. And then again, at the end, I lose him a little bit as well. But the middle section of this podcast, I would say that, you know, the middle 80% is really, really good. And Tom echoes a lot of the things that we've been talking about on this channel as well as the other channels that are like this channel. And it was sort of a relief to hear someone who's been involved in the hobby this long have a stance that supports the work that we're doing here. And I'm not going to say too much more because the, really the conversation definitely speaks for itself. This is somebody who is open-minded and is continuing to change as he learns more about these animals, which I think is one of the worst parts about the reptile hobby. We have way too many people that have been doing the exact same thing for 30 years plus and just assume that because their animals are still, you know, their hearts are still beating, they don't have to change. And Tom is a perfect example of someone who has more experience than all of us yet continues to absorb new information and make changes based off of that information. So let's jump into the conversation. Again, apologies for the sound quality coming in and out. But again, it's Tom Crutchfield. We don't want to complain too much. It was an amazing conversation. And I will see you guys at the end of the episode. Well, Tom, welcome to uh, the podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. You're more than welcome. Glad I can. Thank you for inviting me. You are are probably one of the most recognizable names in American herpetoculture. I'm not sure if you, or do you agree with that statement? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think pretty much most people know who I am. Yep. <laughs> I've been doing it a very, very long time. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you kind of have this strange, you know, the reptile hobby is very divided. We have, you know, lots of people who are on the industrialized sort of more breeding side and then we have people who are more on the naturalistic side and those two sides don't often get along but you are somehow respected greatly on both sides well it's because i don't adhere i, I try to have an open mind about reptiles and certainly i learn stuff about them all of the time i didn't know and as time has progressed i mean i'm in my 70s now the things that I thought about reptiles 
or even how to keep reptiles for that matter, 25 years ago, is not the same as I feel today about them at all mm. because I have learned and sort of evolved. And I think what happens with some people is they get to the point where they feel comfortable with their knowledge and they just don't feel like they think that they already know everything about it. And I'm the first person to say, I don't know anything about it. The more I learn, the less I realize I know. And I, and I think that's what causes the divisions more than anything else, because we really all like the same thing. You know, and I sort of do, I, I fit in with zoos and with the private sector and, and with academia too, because I've sort of dabbled in all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are all here for the same reason. We all have that obsession with animals. And I think you're yeah. so right that people kind of, they have their concrete ways and they have, you can become very inflexible and that's, it, it is a, a science at the end of the day. So we always want to have room there. So can right. you tell me, where did this start? Because you have kind of a crazy reptile journey through your whole life. And has this been around since you were a kid? Yeah, as far back as I can remember, the very first recollection I have of reptiles in me was turning over a rock in my yard and finding a, a, a ring neck snake. Yeah, I was born in North Florida. And uh, that was life changing for me because that was, I, I think, probably one of the most interesting snakes or things at the time I had ever seen, you know, and I, and I knew it wasn't venomous because I already knew the venomous snakes that occurred where I live, but I wasn't sure what kind of snake it is. And of course I looked it up. I was about six years old. So I had a gray rat snake when I was young for like seven years in spite of me not knowing how to keep it well and being forced to keep it outside. Uh, uh, my mother, I, I'd buy a teaman at the Woolworths uh, dime store downtown in the, in the summertime came in were like $2 a piece or something like that. Oh, they were. And the baby turtles with their shells painted were the Podocnema sunophilus, the South African or the South American river turtles. They were everywhere. They were like 69 cents each. So I would always buy those. And then every September, late September, when the water got cold, they would die. And because, of course, I, they didn't want me to have them inside. My parents didn't. So it was, you know, outside or nothing. And you can't do that up in the panhandle of Florida. But I did get two alligators when they, a hunter had killed the female and she'd had a, some of her young with her that were like, you know, uh, real small ones, like, I don't know, a foot long or a little more when I first got them. And I kept those till I was 18 years old in my backyard. Uh, they grew up and I built sort of terrible ponds with fences on them. And then the fences fell down and the alligators didn't leave. And so I finally gave them to Ross Allen. So it did become, it, it began at a very early age, yes. And then when did the transition go from you just using it as a hobby to forming it into a business? Uh, in uh, actually late junior high school, early high school, because as a child in North Florida, the only jobs that were available then were agricultural jobs. And it would be like loading watermelons in the sun in the summertime or in the tobacco farms in Quincy, Florida. And both of those occupations paid 50 cents an hour. It was really hard work. And then I found out that Snakeatorium, which was a tourist attraction at the time, located in Panama City Beach, Florida, which was about 50 miles from where I was born, we would pay 50 cents a foot for a cotton mouse. And uh, 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 Eastern Diamondbacks were a dollar a foot, and, and rat snakes like corns and gray rats and stuff were 50 cents a foot, 50 cents a foot. Now, you couldn't catch so many of the rat snakes in Kings things, although you might catch several in a day, but you could catch in a good night in the dry season, you might get 150 cotton miles, averaging about two and a half feet long. Wow. And even if it was a dollar a piece, if you could get $150 in a night, uh, God, that's what you could wake up working. So we found out we could make a lot more money catching snakes than we mm-hmm. could working, you know, outside in the sun and all of the other stuff that went along with that. So it, uh, it was funny going to Panama City once a week to sell the catch always involved buying alcohol, even though we were underage, somebody would get it for us. And so we, it was a good time. When I read about Florida during that time, especially when it comes to the reptile hobby, it does very much seem like the Wild West. Like you're saying, you can go buy, you know, came in for a, a dollar. Like it just seems bizarre. How, how, and how, there were what is with that? Attractions. Well, there were tourist attractions all over Florida, uh, roadside zoos, uh, tourist traps. Every gas station had an alligator and some of them even had a snake pit. And all of these things were expendable. People just kept them until they died and just simply got more. It was really terrible time for animals in general, but 
for someone like me, it, it was like heaven, you know, because even though I hated what I knew happened to the animals, eventually it was just, you know, I was obsessed by the animals. The rattlesnake rodeos, there were tons of those in uh, Op, Alabama, Chippewa, Florida, uh, Moultrie, Georgia, uh, 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 San Antonio, Florida. I mean, I could go on and on and on. And all kinds of reptiles were brought into those rodeos, too, that people would catch. Like, you know, reptiles that you might not ordinarily get to see. There was a price list even uh, from some people in Punta Gorda that was a roadside zoo, and they sold manatees. Really? Wow. Yeah, fucking manatees. Think about that. That is insane. Do you, know, you know how much they were? How much? A thousand, fifteen, uh, five hundred dollars each, fifteen hundred bucks. Oh my God. And what do you do with a manatee when you buy it? I, if you have a zoo, I guess you build a pool <laughs> and put it in there. I don't, I, I, I don't even know how you would move it, you know, especially back in that time. But they definitely had them for sale. Yeah, that is wild. It is. Yeah, very, very much a different time. And, and then, you know, I actually had watched that, um, uh, National Geographic show that you did, uh, Locked Up Abroad. I think, was that what it was called? Locked Up yeah, Abroad, yeah, I yeah, think. Yeah, Locked Up Abroad, right. Yeah, yeah. So you went through your kind of Wild West experience as well with yeah, reptiles. Yeah, that was nothing, though. That was like a little small thing, really, compared to the overall stuff. Because, I mean, I went to, I finally wound up going to every single continent except for Antarctica. For reptiles. For reptiles, yes. Which is uh, pretty amazing. And, and so at that time... It's it's so hard to picture because it's it's so different than it is it is now. But at that time, did, was that just kind of part of when you were doing that? Was did it feel very normal? Like it was obviously you're kind of bending some rules. But at the time, how did you interpret it? At the time, it wasn't even illegal. When mm. I began the 60s and early 70s, so pretty much you could go pretty much anywhere and declare it or not declare it. It just didn't matter. Mm -hmm. They were still. Clear. Because nobody knew what a CITES permit even was until really in the late 1970s to early 80s. I mean, I think we signed on as a signatory for CITES in 1967. Right. So it was that late just signing, but the, the laws and everything weren't even in place for a good 10 more years or so in terms of being able to, to enforce them. And then they didn't really enforce them because they didn't know how to exactly. Right. So at that time, it was just, you know, that's what people did. I know there was lots of birds they, they coming did. in. Oh, God, yes. I mean, primates, too. You could, I mean, anything might come. It, it, yeah, it was just, I guess, a gray part of the law where, so, you know. Because, well, it was not gray. It just wasn't at that time regulated, really. Right, 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 right. And then, so, at that time, obviously, people are gravitated towards rare things. And I imagine that the rarer the thing, the more money, you know, the rarer the animal, right. the more money it's going to get. <laughs> It, it, it's such an interesting philosophy or, or sort of point of view from humans. We always gravitate towards the rare things. And why do you think that is? Well, because it's, it's, it's just our obsession. We want to, well, I, the first thing it starts from within, we want to stand out from everybody else. And a lot of people attach their entire worth around, and I'm speaking specifically about herpetology or the private sector anyway. And it's not just the private sector. It's the, the zoo people and the academia people, too, for the most part. And we strive to stand out from everybody else. And one of the ways that we stand out is based on what we have or work with. And so I think that we tie our self-worth into having nice things. And, I mean, if you're obsessed by a subject, I mean, if you collected stamps, you wouldn't want common stamps that you could get at the at the post office, you're going to want to get rare stamps or out of print stamps or whatever they call, you know, you know, you know what I mean? It's just, a, exactly. That's, that's really what it's about is the, the ability to stand out in a crowd, I suppose. Yeah. And I mean, and there was, I mean, in, in that little show that it was in, in on that national geographic show, we're talking about, you know, putting snakes into the suitcases and whatnot. And it oh, yeah. is interesting to see, like, you know, just going right through security. And, and like you said, sometimes they ask, it's, you know, it's just for pets and they say, Oh, it's totally fine. Move along. They don't care. They just don't care. Yeah. I mean, nobody cares. They didn't even want to be bothered. The one guy here in Miami that worked for fish and wildlife service in the 70s was named John Thomas. And, uh, I brought the reptiles probably 10 times, uh, when he was the officer, when he was called, and he let him through every time, and he never looked at anything. Mm -hmm. He never even came down there. He didn't even want to come down there. 
and it's sort of interesting to think of how much of the reptile hobby is a foundation on those times, right? Like lots of animals did come into the United uh, States during those times, and that must yeah. have been a big seed for the hobby now. It did. All the rhino iguanas were brought in back then. I, I, I personally went down and collected probably over the years a couple of hundred wild rhinoceros iguanas that I brought into the U.S., and of course they're pretty hardy. And I first began keeping reptiles outside in the 1970s, and I actually bred rhino iguanas in about 1979. Wow. In uh, Fort Myers, Florida, you know, keeping them outside. And that was unheard of in those days. Literally. I, I bred rhicord iguanas. You could get rhicord iguanas as well. How they were in the Dominican Republic all of the time. How difficult was it to catch like a rhino, a rhino iguana, for example, in the wild? Was that a tough well, task? They, they're not, they, you can't just walk up and get them. They live in burrows, but they would run down a burrow and you could dig them out of the burrows. You know, it depends. Some of the, the sakura, I caught also, uh, one time we caught about 50 sak sakura carinata in about a day on Grouper Key, which is uh, off Turks and Caicos. That's not a rhinoceros iguana. That's a Turks and Caicos Island iguana. Mm. It's, a, it's still very common today, and it was then. Uh, I think they estimate there's about 40,000 of them even still today that exist in nature. And uh, we turned them all loose, and I brought back 12. Gotcha. Interesting. Because you... I wanted to keep the price high, too. You know, I didn't. if I had 50, I couldn't have probably sold 50 for any more than I could sell 12. Yes, yeah. And th that's one of the funny things I see in the reptile world, especially on the morph side, is, you know, people try to produce a rare morph, and then for the money and then they, it overproduced it gets overproduced and then there's a question why is the value so low but it's kind of well, obvious it's, it's always so been low. a it's always been a pyramid scheme that's right. what it is yeah nothing more than that have you read the book the lizard king i have and how, i know brian, brian is a good friend of mine actually i know him real well the author of that yeah 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 he's an interesting yeah. guy and so that was just a really interesting story to just sort of see the the roots of the hobby in a lot of ways yeah. so the evolution mm -hmm. As far as you, you're going, you, we were talking earlier how you've progressed in, in the hobby or how, how your pro progression of keeping has, has sort of happened along the time. So what are some ways that you have progressed or your thinking has changed as far as reptile keeping is concerned? Well, the biggest thing of all is that reptiles are far more intelligent than even I thought they were. Mm -hmm. um, we have reptiles here. Well, none of the reptiles here are afraid of people because we don't scare them and we don't allow anybody to scare them. And uh, another thing that we do here is that we keep them in humane caging, uh, uh, pretty much all of them, which means that they live in a cage where they don't feel threatened all of the time. How many collections have you walked into a venomous room, let's say, with crotalans, and the whole room buzzes from the rattlesnakes rattling? You can go in the room that I have with rattlesnakes. I only have six of them, but they're Eastern Diamondbacks. You can jump up and down on the floor, go bang on the cage, and nothing's going to rattle because they're not afraid of you. Mm -hmm. They just don't care. Right. They don't mind you being there. And it's like a, 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 a phrase that I've, I coined some years ago, and I produced a lot of memes to the effect of uh, saying this, and this is true. It's only when both the keeper and the kept lose their fear of each other that the magical understanding really begins. Totally. Because if the animal is afraid of you or if you're afraid of it in any way, you never get to see the animal as it really is. And it's certainly not going to invite you into its life. I, I mean, we have adult sakura here that are free roam in my yard. I mean, like big rhinoceros iguanas, five or six of them. Well, and I saw that, I think it was, was I think it was Dave Kaufman that came down to your place a few weeks ago oh, yeah. and did a video mm -hmm. and it, the, these rhino iguanas are basically acting like you would expect a small dog to behave. They're oh, running around, exactly, they're playing. That's how they act. They play with toys. Uh, my daughter and, and two of the grandkids live here and they, if my, if the grandkids are outside and throwing the ball back and forth and chasing the ball and that, the rhinoceros iguana will run with the ball with them. And not just one, but several of them will. He entertains them. So was there an experience that you had that made you shift the way you were thinking? Like you're saying the intelligence was one thing that you really changed over time. Was there a certain animal or something that you were working with that really made your perspective shift? The biggest thing was I had always kept crocodilians, but never kept a lot of them and never kept them like I did when I had the crocodile farm from about 1990 or 1989 to about, oh, I don't know, to uh, around 1998 or something, about a 10 year period. And crocodilians are actually easily as smart, as smart as any dog or parrot, for sure. 
I mean, they um, they solve simple problems. They set up ambushes. Um, I, I have a video of an American crocodile that lives behind a friend of mine's house on Tavernier, Florida. And there's a trash bag floating in the canal. And on the other side of the canal from him are mangroves hanging down. And on his side is the seawall. And he's got a boat ramp, you know, where you can put a boat in the water where he is. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the crocodile surfaced and pushed a half floating bag of garbage that was floating in the canal up to the boat ramp, pushed it half in and half out of the water, and then backed up three feet away and then sunk down underwater and waited. He set up an ambush for a wow. raccoon or a cat or a dog. Wow. Think about that. That is amazing. And constantly you see pictures of these crocodilians with flo floating vegetation on their bodies or heads. What do you think they're doing with that? They're setting up an ambush. Yeah. Setting up an ambush. That's better than big cats. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting the way reptiles have always kind of had this rap of being fairly dim-witted and not very intelligent. But, but I know, but, but they're not. They're not. Exactly. They're, they're, they're sentient beings. They're really smart, even snakes. I mean, shit, I've got, I could take, I can take any wild crocodile monitor that I've seen so far. I have six of them here. All of them were wild caught. Uh, one of them was considered so dangerous in the zoo when they put it all on here that they couldn't even keep it anymore. And the other, my biggest male bill, the one that sent a lot of photographs was Stacy carrying it around and it acting like a puppy dog. We let it walk around the yard and everything. He's about nine feet long and he, 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 he bit his last owner's left hand and crippled it. Oh. And yet in six, in six months of being here, it's, it's like a puppy dog. So that they, is the they magic learn. of they learn, and if you don't hurt them or scare them, it, but the main thing is you have to under, you have to, you have to understand their behavior, though, mm -hmm. and that means that if you don't scare them, don't enforce the idea that you're a bad person. And then I've had uh, some of the bigger breeders say to to tame Sakura that as soon as you get them, start handling them a lot, even though the poor little baby iguana is scared shitless and runs away because it thinks you're going to kill and eat it every time it picks it up. Right. We don't handle anything. We no. let them come to us, even the small ones. I took a picture the other day of a small Cuban iguana that's about eight months old sitting out here on the wall in my yard. And uh, this is a little lizard that could outrun any of us, and it won't run anywhere. You can walk around the yard sitting on your shoulder, and it's like 15 inches long. Think about wow. that. Well, there is some serious power in allowing the animal choice, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's serious power from day one if you treat them hum in a humane way to begin with. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean keeping ball pythons at little pad, you know, pull out boxes and giant retics and vision cages and all this other nonsense. It's really cruel and inhumane. All the puppy mill producing that's going on now, it's the same as puppy mills, except we're using reptiles instead of puppies. But it's the same thing. And, you know, um, that is a sentiment that I've shared before as well. And it's one that does not get people really don't like that opinion at all although it's hard to deny well, it's it. the truth it's the truth and i don't care and they mm -hmm. can like me or not like me but i somebody has to speak for the animals and to be honest with you i'm a very hard person to debate on that subject yeah and i think that's part of the reason that a lot of the community tries to stay away from looking into whether or not these animals are more intelligent than we thought because as soon as they admit that they are intelligent their care becomes a massive issue correct and it should, and it will, because I am doing my best to introduce reptiles to the world as animals that are different than what we think. Like when I was young, I worked for Ross Allen and Snakeatorium and a lot of other places where I had to do reptile shows that involved wrestling alligators and uh, working with venomous snakes, cobras and rattlesnakes and the more dangerous I made it look, in other words, I tried to make the animals try to kill me, mm. uh, the more tips I got, and it was expected by both the tourists and the management. A good show if I made this rattlesnake come really close to me striking or, or, or made the alligator spin a bunch of times, popping its jaws, trying to bite me and stuff before I caught it when I could just walk up and, or I could train it to come up and I wouldn't even have to wrestle it. It would do whatever I wanted by giving it treats. But the point is nobody wants to see that. They want to see the danger thing in that. And I, and I couldn't help. Every time I got through the show, I, I'd feel a little sad, even if it was a good show, because I knew even though I gave them stellar information and told them how, and how they really are not the threat most people think they are. If you were afraid of rattlesnakes before you saw my show, after my show, you were terrified of them. Mm -hmm. I promise you, because you saw them at their worst. 
you know, a classic mainstream media or mainstream meme is, is using the reptiles as, you know, vicious creatures and it, it never paints a great picture. So I guess even back then you were probably already sensing that these animals were sentient. That's probably where the guilt came from, right? Where you're kind of teaching association that they are maybe a negative creature. I did. Yeah, I felt guilty. And that was one of the things that I heard you say when Dave Kaufman was over. You were very explicit about the fact that it's not just the lizards that are intelligent and the iguanas. It's every reptile. And I think that's a really important point to make because often people associate maybe some more intelligence with your crocodilians or your monitors and not snakes. No, snakes are smart too. I trained the big retic we had here that was six meters long not to come out. Uh, Snakes, all of the reptiles too know the difference in your hand and food. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can hand feed raw meat to the crocodile monitors or eggs. And it'll take it out of our hand without biting us at all. <laughs> Providing you don't snatch your hand at the last moment after the lizard targets the food. That's how accidental mites with monitors happen. It's because the keeper loses his balls at the last minute and he can't <laughs> control them. And when, he's, when he moves quickly like that, the lizard, because of genetic learning over millions of years if the prey is escaping you stop it by grabbing it so that's what they do and that's what an accidental monitor bite is about it's not that the lizard making a mistake that your hand for food it's about you making the lizard make a mistake and i've proven it a thousand times here with numerous animals snakes are a problem because snakes bite first and ask questions later because they take their prey from afar right venomous and harmless but it's easy to train them not to and once you do, then they're done with it and they learn quickly and they remember. So, so what sort of things did you do to train that reticulated python, for example? When they would come running out, I'd come in with rabbits and I only had to do it once and it just stopped after that. And uh, I had a piece of PVC pipe and when it ran up and that, you know, stalking ready to grab from a distance and probably grab me too, I'd tap it on the head and on the nose with a PVC pipe. Mm-hmm. And it did that two or three times with me in there with a the rabbit, and then it stopped. And then I went back out and didn't feel it. And I came back in about 30 minutes later with the rabbit again, and it came running up, and I had the pipe. And at first, it came running up like it, like it always did, you know, like it was going to strike first and ask questions later. And I had the pipe, but I didn't even hit it, but it saw the pipe in the minute, and I hit the pipe on the ground kind of in front of it. It stopped what it was doing. I walked over and handed it to the rabbit. From there on out, that's what it did. Interesting every time i have videos of it wow well, you know and speaking of reticulated pythons that, that was one of the videos that i had made on youtube and, and yep. you had shared it on facebook a couple weeks ago just just basically asking the question that we do have some animals in the hobby that are fairly staple animals but they probably shouldn't be we have some massive animals that people yeah, are buying but we, we don't have room for we we shouldn't have all of the giant snakes in the hobby it's bad for the snakes and it's bad for us yeah it truly is. It's, it's, for one thing, there's no way the average person can keep an adult reticulate python in a humane way unless you're going to give it an entire bedroom as a cage. <laughs> Which, by the way, when I was really young, that's what I did. When we were young, we kept giant snakes in big cages back then. We didn't, we didn't do it like we do today. We didn't. This, this is sort of a new phenomenon. We didn't know how to keep reptiles, but we knew that big reptiles needed big cages. We knew that. Yeah, I'm not really sure what happened and why that changed in the last Money. 10 years. Money, Money in the yeah. last 20 years, yeah. It's about keeping a large amount of animals in the smallest amount of space. Hmm. Not taking into consideration any of the feelings of the animal at all. Will they live? Yep. Will they breed? Yes. But breeding is not necessarily... Yes. That's only one of the things you can use to... to to prove that the animals are in, in, in pretty good shape. And it just means that they're in good health because breeding is a natural phenomenon that's only slightly different than eating or breathing. It's something that exactly. the animals do if they're healthy enough to do it. So, But that doesn't mean that they live a happy life and that they're not mentally ill. Yeah, I totally agree. I think our definition of health in the hobby is pretty weak. We basically say as long as its heart is beating and it's doing very, very basic things, we uh, we just count that as a win on our part, and, and we don't and know how much the animal's suffering. Correct. That's why you see all of the big retics in particular with the the bump in the, their nose in front of their eye. I call it the Roman nose syndrome because that's from pushing, desperately trying to get out all, all of the time. Yeah. particularly in the foxes. A reticulate python uses every part of the ecosystem it lives in. They climb, they 
they swim, they, um, uh, a, a 20-foot retic can go right up a, 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 a coconut palm by just wrapping around it and going straight up to the top quick as, 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 as quicker than you could even imagine. Yeah. And, and they, and the people that have the ball pythons and claim that all they do is live in a termite mound. No, they don't. They climb trees and they crawl. They, if you go and look at the natural history of people that have put, uh, you know, telemetry devices and follow their movements, these animals have big ranges and they're very active. Yeah. But yeah, we can justify it because they're stupid and they don't have feelings and it doesn't matter. Exactly. So what is your opinion on the morph side of things? I know you work with morphs yourself, but I think I, personally I always kind of associate that with the money and, and more of the industrialized care. And maybe that's not quite right, but I was just wondering what you think about it. Well, the morph thing definitely uh, has taken over like big time. And really the catalyst that started it all was the, the albino Burmese pythons, which I played the biggest part in getting here because I'm the one that financed getting them here. Right in the first place, and got and Bob Clark got his from me, uh, and I actually bred him about the same time he did too. Uh, but anyway, the 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 morphs are are nice, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think it, it could continue. Uh, my God, for but it's it's more about the kind of animal it is more than anything else. Mm. I mean, if you're producing pet morph ticks. And even iguanas. I have a problem with, with, with a lot of people on how they keep iguanas because they need space and just people don't, can't give them the space that they really need to give them for the most part. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it, it's always weird when you see a bunch of reticulated python morphs and, and yeah, they do look amazing. But like they we're are. saying, it, it's tough to, for the average person to keep. So as far as your retics, what size of enclosure are they in? I know they're outside. Well, I don't have any retics now. I only had the one. I have mm. not kept or bred retics in like 20 years because oh, okay. I never, I, I stopped even selling them except for the occasional real big one. And but real big ones, when you sell to attractions and stuff, usually have a pretty good life. But it's the ones that go into breeding places where people have multiple ones. It's where they suffer for the most part because they just can't house that many. But uh, I kept the last one I had. The big one was in a cage that was 12 feet uh, by 16 feet by 8 feet tall with a pool in it with running water. Yeah, so that's much larger than the average enclosure we see. Correct. But that's the minimum you really should have for a snake mm -hmm. that's 18 or 20 feet long. I mean, if, it's, if the cage isn't that big, it's just not big enough. I think that the perimeter minimal, minimal, uh, cage sizing for giant snakes, I think, should be 2.5 times. The perimeter should be 2.5 times the length of the, 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 the snake. Yeah. So, so. What, what do we do about it? Uh, the fact, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of big snakes and, and other big, huge lizards as well in the hobby. Is there anything that we can do or is that just sort of at this point, just let it rip and, and hopefully people eventually figure it out to provide more space? Um, the, the, the real hope for the whole thing is education. And I'm, I, I, I hit on that every single day in all of my posts mm -hmm. on all of the animals. And what we're doing this year is actually I'm, I, I'm going to go out of the iguana breeding business. I'm going to keep a few of the morphs I have. And that's it. Uh, pretty much mainly because the, the hits and stuff are just hard to sell now and they're too cheap. And most of the people that buy them wouldn't take care of them. Right. So I have a problem morally with selling them, but then they're a byproduct of producing the other stuff. And even though our adults are kept really humanely in big outdoor cages, uh, these that we sell is not necessarily the truth. You know, they may not have as good of a life and that bothers me. So I'm going to, to stop producing so many and produce mostly just a hundred percent more, more than anything else. And most of the people that buy expensive morphs, at least, it's not a, it's not a, a, a buy on a whim. You right. Know, if they're paying $1,000 or more for an animal, the chances are they are know a lot about. Yeah. But if they're paying $25 for the animal because Jimmy, their son, wanted to do that reptile show, they don't, they, they don't, they, it's just going to die real quick. And that's a problem. I have a real problem with that. 
and we don't police ourselves. That's another thing, too. We can sort of qualify people, too, by telling them the truth about what they're buying. But we don't do that either. We'll even lie to make a sale, and that bothers me. That's one of the reasons I didn't take on breeding myself is I, you do feel morally responsible for the offspring and there is so much bad husbandry out there. It's, you feel almost guilty selling him. Correct. That's how I feel. Can you tell me a little bit about your Manchen, uh, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, Manchen Vipers? Because I know you've just upgraded them to a large, or recently into a very large cage. Yeah, Manchen Vipers were new. They, yeah, newly, they were known to science until I think it was 2002 or 2003. And they were discovered in China. And as soon as I saw the snakes, the pictures of them, I was like, wow. And some became available in Hong Kong. So early on, about 2008, I think it was, I imported uh, uh, I imported three shipments of them. And one of the shipments, I had 25 pairs. Uh, so wow. I, I imported probably around 100 of them, all hatchlings. And these were all gotten from wild-caught gravid snakes and hatching the eggs and that sort of thing. And uh, I, uh, I sold pretty much all of them. I kept a trio, and then I, I was keeping them outside for a while while I was raising them up. And uh, one of them got a tick in, inside of the uh, heat pit, which caused his head to swell up. And by the time I took it to the vent, we took it out, gave it antibiotics, and still died. And then I, of course, moved him inside. The male accidentally hung himself in a track. The main uh, uh, the vision cages. Oh yeah. So that's happened before with other snakes too. That's a sort of a bad thing about those cages. And I only had one for a very long time, and then I had a chance to buy two point two more, and I had to raise those up again uh, to breed my big one. But I built a, a really big, big cage uh, inside of a building. And it incorporates two windows where they get real unfiltered sunlight as well as get rained on. Like if the rain is hard. And so that seems to be working out really well. The cage is 18 feet long. It's four feet wide. The cage sits three feet off the ground and it's five feet tall. So the snakes with the big limbs in there can get eight feet off the ground, literally. Mm-hmm. And we're having a lot of courtship and everything. I'm fairly reasonably sure we're going to have eggs this year. Cages, but in a really nice, humane way. And Which makes, makes a huge yeah. difference. It does. And I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the things I love about more sensitive species is it almost forces people to just try to replicate nature as much as possible. And as soon as you do that, the animals start rewarding you with all these amazing natural behaviors and they'll start doing what they would normally do. (laughs) They do. And if they're not afraid of me, they let you see those behaviors. That's how come we can get all those videos of all the monitors of the the crop monitor courtship stuff people have never even seen. They literally go in circles on the floor after each other and crawl over each other. It's, 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 did you see the videos I did on that? Nobody even did that because you're not ever going to see wildlife do that. They're not ever going to let you see them. Exactly. And most captive ones aren't going to let you see them because they're scared of you because of how you keep them. They'll stop what they're doing whenever you walk up. Here, they don't care. They don't care if you're in the cage. They literally aren't afraid. That is really amazing. And that, so that's just the trust that you have established with each of the animals that you have. Yeah, but not just with them. We have a lot of wild reptiles here. There's giant dead geckos that are invasive in, in, in Day County everywhere. My yard is no, uh, uh, it's just covered in them. And <laughs> at different places in the yard, we give them honey. And they literally, when you, if you're standing there, they'll come out if they're hungry and stare at you until you give them honey. You put honey on your fingers, they'll come down and lick it off your fingers. These are wild, giant gay geckos. And I have videos of them coming down a coconut palm. We have red, those uh, gamma picticeps, red-headed gammas, by the thousands here in Dade County. And ours in my yard, there's a big group that lives uh, by my house, uh, 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 Geronimo and his uh, females, and the other one is Rambito on the other side and his females. And they will come up and eat mealworms out of your hand. You can call them. Wow. If you tap on the top of the wall, they come running over. These are wild. We never, we never touch them. We never try to catch them or anything else, but they'll sit on you and eat. They learn, right? They learn that, that you'll give them food and they're happy to continue that. They do. Quickly. They learn very quickly. 
They're not stupid by any stretch no. of the imagination. No, well, that's one. Of, that was one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you because I think that it there, there's not enough people with a, with that sort of mindset where we are just scratching the surface of the intelligence of these animals, oh, and, and there's so much more very, we can do with very, them. Very, very intelligent. Mm-hmm. And I just wish that we would treat them better than we do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I think, is there anything else that you wanted to add to this conversation? I think we've had a, a quite a quite a good chat here. There's definitely some great sound bites in here. Is there anything else you'd want to add to just the reptile community in general that we didn't cover yet? Okay, okay. Here's the last thing. Let me just say this. I think that I promise you it will benefit both the keeper and the kept. Perfect. Well, Tom, Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate that. And I'll, I'll let you no know worries. when I post this. All right. Thanks, man. You have a good day. Yes, you as well. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Right, bye-bye. So as you can hear at the end there, I was just losing him. So we didn't quite get a full closing statement from Tom. But I'm just going to finish that off for him because I know what he was saying. He was basically saying keeping your animals and your reptiles in a humane way will benefit both you, the keeper, and the reptiles, the kept. And I think that was a great way to wrap up that episode. Tom, if you're listening to this, thank you so much for spending the time with me. I do really, really appreciate it. And I hope one day I can see you in person once the world opens up again and maybe we can get an in-person interview. We don't have to worry about Wi-Fi signals and we can just chat for an hour or two to get some of those amazing stories out of your brain. But I really appreciate that 35 minutes. And like I said in the intro, it was just so refreshing to hear somebody who's been in the hobby for that long yet continues to allow the animals to teach him and then continues to absorb that information and implement it in their care. And that is exactly what Tom's doing. So again, I really enjoyed that, listeners. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you could bear with some of the audio quality issues. I know it wasn't perfect, but there was a lot in there that I don't think there was much audio issues. It would have just been nice to you know, get a full podcast episode. And like I said, maybe one day we'll do that with Tom. So thank you very much for listening. If you did enjoy this episode, make sure you share it on social media, on Facebook and Instagram. And if you do, tag me in it so I can thank you. If you are interested in more information on this episode, head to animalsathomenetwork.com. And you can also follow Tom's Facebook page. If you just type in Tom Crutchfield on Facebook, it will bring up his Facebook page. And also, if you just type his name in on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of videos, you know, Dave Kaufman, Kenan, all, you know, all the sort of the big reptile names going to his, his home, and you can look at his animals there. And... Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Again, if you're looking for any high-quality reptile equipment, definitely go check them out. There are links in the description as well as the show notes. And I think that is it for this episode. We've got a couple great episodes coming up. I've already recorded a few of them. I'm definitely excited to share them with you guys. So stay tuned for that. And we'll have a few new YouTube videos coming out as well in the next week or so. I will catch you guys next time.